Now, Adam Boulukas joins me now from Jerusalem. He's the director of the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees in the occupied West Bank. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, uh, Adam, uh, UNRWA's Commissioner General tweeted this week, and I'll just read part of it. He said, it's hard to keep up with the lives lost given how pervasive the violence has become, and went on to say, quote, fear, despair, tensions are magnified, lives and futures are put on hold. So while the world's attention is understandably fixed on Gaza, how would you summarise what's been happening in the West Bank, the impact of Israeli operations there? Well, the situation in the West Bank is, is the worst it's been in, in many, many years. In, in fact, it was already bad before the 7th of October. Uh, this year was a record year in terms, or last year, pardon me, 2023, 20, uh, was a record year in terms of, of lives lost. At the end of the year, uh, something like over 500 Palestinians were killed. Over half of them were uh, were refugees. Uh, this number is over three times that of 2022, which was the worst year on record. We thought, whoa, it can't get any worse than 2022, and we got into 2023. So it's been an extremely violent year. Since the 7th of October, things have been ramped up. Uh, we have frequent uh, incursions. Over 10,000 uh, Israeli military incursions in the West Bank in all of 2023, and a large portion of them coming after the 7th of October. Wow. 6,000 people arrested. So it's a very, very violent, very volatile context at the moment. And, and, and Philippe uh, Lazzarini also said, and I'll quote him again, recent incursions caused severe damage to infrastructure, mm -hmm. including water and electricity networks, and impacted entire communities. Now, critics of right. Israel say there's been a deliberate targeting of infrastructure in Gaza. Are you seeing that in the West Bank? Deliberate destruction of roads, businesses, uh, private property, and so on. There's plenty of videos out there. Yeah, well, it's disproportionate. I mean, that's the way that I would describe it. Um, now, if we talk to our military counterparts in, in Israel, and we do have regular meetings with them, their concern is over improvised explosive devices, IEDs that are buried in the street or on the sides of the roads, and the ripping up of road uh, networks with very heavy equipment, demining equipment, uh, has a, the, the sort of collateral damage problem of damaging the water networks, electricity networks, communication networks, in an effort to deal with the IEDs. Um, but certainly uh, uh, domestic dwellings have been uh, severely damaged, uh, shops have been damaged, even our own offices have been impacted. So the physical infrastructure damage then has, a, has a, the effect of, of um, uh, um, you know, ha having this impact across a refugee camp or across a village, mm. uh, because the municipalities can't keep up with that level of damage, I'm afraid. What role are, are radical settlers playing in the level of West Bank violence and, and uh, what's happening to Palestinians, particularly in the villages? Yeah, well, immediately after the 7th of October, I had this feeling that the settlers were kind of, in a way, you know, let loose. Um, there was kind of no, so much attention on Gaza, rightly so. It's a tragic, horrific situation in Gaza. But in the West Bank, um, you know, the settlers were maybe saw this as an opportunity uh, to be a bit more aggressive. Uh, they were then they're armed rather than just having stones. We had over a thousand um, Palestinians driven from their homes by by intimidation, fear, scare tactics such as the burning of olive orchards. Uh, over a thousand, as I said, driven driven out. Now we've seen a bit of a drop in that. I think some of it is because of the international pressure uh, to, to the Israelis to kind of get a handle on this population. Um, but it might also be that the numbers have dropped because most of the people who they wished to drive out have been driven out. Uh, yeah. So the targets of that of that violence from the settlers is now is now is now geographically shifted. As, as you watch, uh, I know your focus is the West Bank, but as you watch all of this unfold, I mean, Israel talks uh, about, you know, de-radicalizing Gaza. But when you see what's happening uh, to civilians in, in the West Bank, where your focus is, uh, mm -hmm. wh when you talk to them, isn't the risk to Israel of more, not less anger and potential for radicalization and hatred? That would seem to be the case. You know, people in the in the West Bank, you know, we're, we're told kind of a couple of different narratives We're we're told that uh, the war is against Hamas and the war is in Gaza and the war is not in the West Bank. But since the 7th of October, there's been a complete military lockdown on the West Bank. So there's very little movement between village to village. You have no West Bankers going into Israel to work. This is a really important uh, factor in the in the in the landscape. Um, so, you know, a huge portion of the income into the West Bank comes from, from those that work in Israel. None of them have been able to move. None of our own staff 
in fact, in the United Nations and international community, are able to come into Jerusalem. We have hundreds of staff in UNRWA that are unable to move. Uh, so you have these access restrictions, you have economic restrictions, uh, you have an increased level of incursions, they're much more violent, they're much longer. It's not the one or two hour search and arrest operations. Some of them are going on for days. Uh, so the livability in a refugee camp, the livability in a village in the West Bank is, is decreasing. Uh, all of this at the, you know, uh, uh, just immediately after the 7th of October. Mm. So the West Bank is absolutely part of this uh, conflict, maybe in a different way, maybe it's not labeled as such. But when 6,000 people are arrested or detained uh, in the West Bank since the 7th of October, that's an enormous number. Yeah. Um, so the livability and the tension is, is absolutely palpable. And we're almost out of time, but uh, I wanted to ask you this. There's yet to be a massive organized grassroots flare up by Palestinians in the West Bank yet. I, I mean, I, I covered the first and the second intifada on the yeah. ground. Do you worry about a third one? We worry about it, but I'm... Uh, what, what I think is maybe the, the biggest issue is that because people are not moving and you have large numbers of people who are idle, not working, not busy, if there are large protests of whatever kind, a gathering after funerals uh, on a Friday, after Friday uh, prayers, and then they clash with, let's say, a settler group and there's some kind of flare up like that, which is very hard to control or manage or predict because you have masses of people, this, this may, may be the, uh, you know, a bit of fire uh, that could ignite things. We're hoping that we do keep a calm and we're trying our very best in UNRWA to continue to deliver services, which is, we feel, the best way to encourage stability. Yeah, uh, certainly worrying uh, situation there. Adam Abulukas uh, with UNRWA, thank you so much. Really appreciate the time. Thank you.